Good evening and welcome. Tonight's story is the story of The Good Little Boy by Mark Twain. Once there was a good little boy by the name of Jacob Livens. He always obeyed his parents, no matter how absurd and unreasonable their demands were, and he always learned his book and never was late at Sabbath school. He would not play hooky, even when his sober judgment told him it was the most profitable thing he could do. None of the other boys could ever make that boy out. He acted so strangely. He wouldn't lie, no matter how convenient it was. He just said it was wrong to lie, and that was sufficient for him. And he was so honest that he was simply ridiculous. The curious ways that that Jacob had surpassed everything. He wouldn't play marbles on Sunday. He wouldn't rob birds' nests. He wouldn't give hot pennies to organ grinders' monkeys. He didn't seem to take any interest in any kind of rational amusement. So the other boys used to try to reason it out and come to an understanding of him, but they couldn't arrive at any satisfactory conclusion. As I said before, they could only figure out a sort of vague idea that he was afflicted, and so they took him under their protection and never allowed any harm to come to him. This good little boy read all the Sunday school books. They were his greatest delight. This was the whole secret of it. He believed in the good little boys they put in the Sunday school books. He had every confidence in them. He longed to come across one of them alive once, but he never did. They all died before his time, maybe. Whenever he read about a particular good one, he turned over quickly to the end to see what became of him, because he wanted to travel thousands of miles and gaze on him. But it wasn't any use. That good little boy always died in the last chapter, and there was a picture of the funeral, with all his relations and the Sunday school children standing around the grave in pantaloons that were too short and bonnets that were too large, and everybody crying into handkerchiefs that had as much as a yard and a half of stuff in them. He was always headed off in this way. He never could see one of the good little boys on account of his always dying in the last chapter. Jacob had a noble ambition to be put in a Sunday school book. He wanted to be put in, with pictures representing him gloriously declining to lie to his mother, and her weeping for joy about it, and pictures representing him standing on the doorstep giving a penny to a poor beggar woman with six children, and telling her to spend it freely, but not to be extravagant, because extravagance is a sin and pictures of him magnanimously refusing to tell on the bad boy who always lay in wait for him around the corner as he came from school and welted him over the head with a lathe and then chased him home saying, Ha ha! as he proceeded. That was the ambition of young Jacob Livens. He wished to be put in a Sunday school book. It made him feel a little uncomfortable sometimes, when he reflected that the good little boys always died. He loved to live, you know, and this was the most unpleasant feature about being a Sunday school book boy. He knew it was not healthy to be good. He knew it was more fatal than consumption to be supernaturally good, as the boys in the books were. He knew that none of them had ever been able to stand it long, and it pained him to think that if they put him in a book, he wouldn't ever see it. Or even if they did get the book out before he died, it wouldn't be popular without any pictures of his funeral in the back part of it. He couldn't be much of a Sunday school book that couldn't tell about the evidence he gave to the community when he was dying. So at last, of course, he had to make up his mind to do the best he could under the circumstances, to live right and hang on as long as he could and have his dying speech already when his time came. But somehow nothing ever went right with this good little boy. Nothing ever turned out with him the way it turned out with the good little boys in the book. They always had a good time, and the bad boys had the broken legs. But in his case, there was a screw loose somewhere, and it all happened just the other way. 
when he found Jim Blake stealing apples and went under the tree to read to him about the bad little boy who fell out of the neighbor's apple tree and broke his arm. Jim fell out of the tree too, but he fell on him and broke his arm, and Jim wasn't hurt at all. Jacob couldn't understand that. There wasn't anything in the books like it. And once, when some bad boys pushed a blind man over in the mud, and Jacob ran to help him up and receive his blessing, the blind man did not give him any blessing at all, but whacked him over the head with his stick and said he would like to catch him shoving him again and then pretending to help him up. This was not in accordance with any of the books. Jacob looked them all over to see. One thing that Jacob wanted to do was to find a lame dog that hadn't any place to stay and was hungry and persecuted and bring him home and pet him and have that dog in perishable gratitude. And at last he found one and was happy, and he brought him home and fed him, but when he was going to pet him, the dog flew at him and tore all the clothes off him, except those that were in front, and made a spectacle of him that was astonishing. He examined authorities, but he could not understand the matter. It was of the same breed of dogs that was in the books, but it acted very differently. Whatever this boy did, he got into trouble. The very things the boys in the books got rewarded for turned out to be about the most unprofitable things he could invest in. Once, when he was on his way to Sunday school, he saw some bad boys starting off pleasuring in a sailboat. He was filled with consternation, because he knew from his reading the boys who went sailing on Sunday invariably got drowned. So he ran out on a raft to warn them, but a log turned with him and slid him into the river. A man got him out pretty soon, and the doctor pumped the water out of him and gave him a fresh start with his bellows, but he caught cold and lay sick abed nine weeks. But the most unaccountable thing about it was that the bad boys in the boat had a good time all day, and they reached home alive and well in the most surprising manner. Jacob Bliven said there was nothing like these and things in the book. He was perfectly dumbfounded. When he got well, he was a little discouraged, but he resolved to keep on trying anyhow. He knew that so far his experience wouldn't do to go in a book, but he hadn't yet reached the allotted term of life for good little boys, and he hoped to be able to make a record of yet uh, if he could hold on till his time was fully up. If everything else failed, he had his dying speech to fall back on. He examined his authorities and found that it was now time for him to go to sea as a cabin boy. He called on a ship captain and made his application, and when the captain asked for his recommendations, he proudly drew out a tract and pointed to the word. To Jacob Blivens, from his affectionate teacher. But the captain was a coarse, vulgar man and said, Oh, that be blowed. That wasn't any proof that he knew how to wash dishes or handle a slush bucket, and he guessed he didn't want him. This was altogether the most extraordinary thing that ever happened to Jacob in all his life. A compliment from a teacher, on a tract, had never failed to move the tenderest emotions of ship captains, and open the way to all offices of honor and profits in their gift. It never had in any book that he ever had read. He could hardly believe his senses. This boy always had a hard time of it. Nothing ever came out according to the authorities with him. At last, one day, when he was around hunting up bad little boys to admonish, he found a lot of them in the old iron foundry, fixing up a little joke on fourteen or fifteen dogs, which they had tied together in long procession, and were going to ornament with empty nitroglycerin cans made fast to their tails. Jacob's heart was touched. He sat down on one of those cans, for he never minded grease when duty was before him, and he took hold of the foremost dog by the collar and turned his reproving eye upon the wicked Tom Jones. But just at that moment, Alderman McQuelter, full of wrath, stepped in. All the boys ran away. 
But Jacob Blivens arose in conscious innocence and began one of those stately little Sunday school book speeches which always commence with, Oh, sir! in dead opposition to the fact that no boy, good or bad, ever starts a remark with, Oh, sir! But the alderman never waited to hear the rest. He took Jacob Livens by the ear and turned him around and hit him with a, a whack in the rear with the flat of his hand, and in an instant that good little boy shot out through the roof and soared away toward the sun, with the fragments of those fifteen dogs stringing after him like the tail of a kite. And there wasn't a sign of that alderman or that old iron foundry left on the face of the earth. And as for young Jacob Livens, he never got a chance to make his last dying speech, after all his trouble fixing it up, unless he made it to the birds, because although the bulk of him came down all right in a treetop in an adjoining county, the rest of him was apportioned around among the townships, and so they had to hold five inquests on him to find out whether he was dead or not, and how it occurred. You never saw a boy scattered so. Thus perished the good little boy who did the best he could, but didn't come out according to the books. Every boy who ever did, as he did prosper except him. His case is truly remarkable. It will probably never be accounted for. The Story of the Good Little Boy by Mark Twain Thank you so much for listening. Good night, everybody.